Let us pray. Guide us, O God, by your word and Holy Spirit, that in your light we may see light, in your truth find freedom, and in your peace we will discover peace. Through Christ our Lord, amen. This morning I will be reading from John's Gospel as he shares the narrative of Jesus' baptism and the calling of the first disciples which looks really quite different from the ones told in the synoptic gospels, that's Matthew, Mark, and Luke. The lesson begins with John the Baptist looking back on Jesus' baptism and sharing his thoughts with those around him, which certainly catches their attention. The next day, Jesus walks by John, and some people begin to follow him. Jesus' invitation is quite simple. Come and see. Let us listen now to the word of God according to the first chapter of John's Gospel, verses 29 through 46. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and declared, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks ahead of me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but I came baptizing with water for this reason, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him. But the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. The next day, John again was standing with two of his disciples, and as he watched Jesus walk by, he exclaimed, Look! Here is the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, What are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and see. They came and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated anointed. He brought Simon to Jesus, who looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You are to be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him about whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph, Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Sometimes conversations really stick out to me, and then I carry them with me. Um, A few years back, my husband Jason and I were having a conversation. He's not here at this service, so you can't consult him about how I hang on to things, but that's okay. But we were having a conversation on what it means to be uncomfortable and the experiences that can make us feel that way. He shared with me that for him, being uncomfortable evokes negative emotions. I asked him if he thought being uncomfortable 
could spark a positive outcome. As our conversation continued, let's just say that we agreed to disagree. As time went by, though, I kept revisiting our conversation and decided to consult Miriam Webster, which defines a, uncomfortable as causing discomfort or annoyance or feeling discomfort. Then I looked up the meaning of discomfort, and it said to make uneasy. I searched for synonyms and discovered these. Aching, angry, anguished, annoyed, comfortless, disturbed, exhausted, fatigued, harsh, miserable, pained, restless. And that's where I stopped. Restless. Monday is the birthday of the late Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., whose message made many people uncomfortable. For some, this was good, raising awareness about racism, thus calling them into action to stand together against injustice and oppression. But for others, being uncomfortable caused their hatred to fester and surface in negative and violent ways. Just imagine how Dr. King felt. But being uncomfortable isn't all bad, especially if we respond with an open heart and an open mind, recognizing there are things within us that need to be worked on to improve our relationships with one another, to improve our relationship with God, to put aside our judgmental ways, to begin calling one another by name instead of by their gender or by their sex or the color of their skin. To recognize and celebrate that every human being on this earth was created in God's image. Jumping back to our text, John tells the story of his experience gives testimony and acknowledges the greatness of Jesus, who he proclaims as God's son. As Jesus walks by, John the Baptist declares, here is the Lamb of God. And so Jesus is identified as the suffering servant prophesied by Isaiah. As the paschal lamb, Jesus' sacrificial death takes away the sins of the world. Jesus as the Lamb of God was probably much easier for first century people, especially first century Jews, to understand than it is for many of us here today in the 21st century. You see, they had a practice of sacrificing what was best basically the best lamb, in order to make up for their failings, to show God how sorry they were and how much they wanted to sacrifice so they could best restore their relationship with God. It is in this context that God comes to us in human flesh, determined to make things right in our relation, relationship. Sin has consequences. We can see that. It's not easy for us to talk about. It's very uncomfortable. But this we know to be true. It is not difficult to see how sin damages relationships. So God comes and makes the ultimate sacrifice. God's own self in the person of Christ Jesus. God says, I want this relationship restored so much, I will sacrifice my very own life, my son, my freedom, in order to restore yours. Christ leads us by example into the life-giving value of sacrificial love. How else would we be drawn to do anything other than preserve and protect ourselves at all costs? 
to others. One of the most profound ironies of this narrative and of all the stories in the gospel where Jesus is calling people to be his disciples is this. He says, come and see. He says, follow me. We think we have to see first, believe first, then we'll go, then we'll join in, because that's what's comfortable for us. We want evidence. But this isn't the case. In the gospel stories, they always follow first. Then they begin to be amazed and believed. And then they invite someone else into the story. Dr. King once said, faith is taking the first step even when you don't see the whole staircase. He also said, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. We cannot be silent about Christ's sacrificial love. Nor can we be silent about the dehumanization of people whom Christ loves. King said, every person must decide whether he or she will walk in the light of creative altruism or in the darkness of destructive selfishness. Christ showed us perfect altruism, selflessness for the benefit of others. This next piece, however, might make some of you uncomfortable, but it's not a bad thing. It's not meant to instill fear. Challenging, yes, but fear, no. I'm talking about evangelism and social justice, two sides of the same coin of sacrificial love. Friends, a relationship with God gives us the power to overcome whatever sin we may be struggling with, whether it be racism, sexism, or something else. These things not only stand as a barrier between people, but as an offense between us and God. You see, the reason Dr. King identified Christ as a solution to the problem of racism is Jesus' death on the cross paid the price for all our sins. He then rose from the dead and now offers us the forgiveness of God and the power to live new lives. Dr. King put it this way, man is a sinner in need of God's forgiving grace. This is not deadening pessimism. It is Christian realism. Our need for Jesus is truly the great equalizer of the races of humankind. We are all sinners in need of a savior. We all stand before God broken, not on the basis of our self-proclaimed superiority over another morally, culturally, financially, politically, or in any other way. And so this morning, I challenge you to think about how Christ, the Lamb of God, loves you. Just as you are. He lived and died and was raised to restore our, all our brokenness to wholeness, to invite us into a life of making others whole by sharing our God stories, telling the good news of Christ's love, and living by the power and fruit of the Holy Spirit. Beloved, the Spirit is working in you to remind you of the transcendent value of your humanity, to refresh you in the baptismal, in the fountain of baptismal life, and to assure you that you belong to Christ, the Lamb of God, who says over and over and over again, come and see. Amen.